Good evening, everyone. Welcome to our first live streamed event of the 2020-21 academic year. My name is Reagan Corum, and I am a second year member of Markets and Morality. We are all grateful for you here tonight attending virtually, and we are also grateful for our co-sponsors, Hope College's Green Team, the Department of Economics and Business, and the Acton Institute. Thank you for your contributions to this event that is certain to provide an exciting start to Markets and Morality's lecture series this year. As a student in Markets and Morality, or m, &M I have grown in the ways I think about the world in choosing awareness and thoughtfulness over fear and hope in cooperative solutions to dilemmas that are beyond the control of any one person. As an intellectually curious group of students, m, m is rooted in personal responsibility for thinking, not just feeling, about things that matter. We work to extend the Hope College student body and beyond this purpose of engaging hearts and minds for human flourishing. If you are interested in learning more about Markets and Morality, our events, or what it means to be more involved, student or otherwise, please reach out. You can contact us through Facebook or Instagram, or by emailing us at marketsandmorality at hope.edu. This year, Markets and Morality is exploring reasons for being humbly optimistic and confidently hopeful. As students of history, economics, and culture, we can see the significant improvements that have come with the increasing access to markets around the world. We have observed what human ingenuity can do when harnessed by mutually beneficial exchange. We are aware that many people still lack the protection of the rule of law and this access to markets where they can employ their God-given gifts. The brokenness in our world is also perceptible in our natural environment, but we are not without hope. So tonight, we are honored to hear from Dr. Peter J. Hill, who will address reasons for his optimism for environmental health and stewardship. As Dr. Hill is speaking, please feel free to submit any questions with the submit a question button and we will address what we can at the end of the lecture. I will now invite Dr. Sarah Estelle, a professor of economics and the founding director of Hope's Markets and Morality student organization to introduce our special guest and speaker. Thank you, Professor Estelle. Thank you, Reagan. And I wanna echo Reagan's gratitude to our audience who's gathered here virtually. Uh, our theme is optimism, and we're counting as a major silver lining of our online programming that we can welcome people from all over the country and multiple places even outside the country. We have quite an audience gathered, so thanks for your time. Um, I want to mention three schools in particular that have done a very nice job of gathering a sizable contingent of their students to join us. Aquinas College, Florida Gulf Coast University, and Samford University but we thank everyone for being here. It is really a privilege for me to introduce our speaker this evening, Dr. Peter J. Hill. Dr. Hill is Professor of Economics Emeritus at Wheaton College and a Senior Fellow at the Property and Environment Research Center in Bozeman, Montana. He has co-authored three books, Growth and Welfare in the American Past, The Birth of a Transfer Society, and one of my favorite economics books, The Not-So-Wild Wild West, Property Rights on the Frontier. He has also published numerous articles on the theory of property rights and institutional change, and on morality, especially Christian theology and markets. He has edited six books on environmental economics. In fact, Dr. Hill has special personal credibility in the area of natural resource management and that he has owned and operated two cattle ranches. First, a large ranch in Eastern Montana that he operated with his family until 1992, and then a smaller ranch in Western Montana, which he operated until 2012. Dr. Hill's undergraduate degree is from Montana State University and his PhD from the illustrious University of Chicago. A brilliant economic historian, he is also a gifted teacher, and I would add a faithful Christian, which gives him both the ability and the desire to think Christianly. As a former student of his once remarked, Dr. Hill does not confuse rigorous, sophisticated thinking with inscrutability. We'll be thankful for that this evening, as well as his commitment to seeking truth because we will need both of those things uh, in order to understand and grapple with some of these complex environmental issues we'll discuss tonight. Thank you for joining us, Dr. Hill. Thank you. It is uh, 
good to be here. I'm talking to you from Bozeman, Montana. It's uh, raining here, but my guess is about a thousand feet higher up on the mountains, uh, we're getting a pretty good uh, dose of snow. So my lecture this evening is entitled Stewardship for Everyone, an e Economist Proposal for Environmental Health. And I'm assuming that that's coming up on the screen there. Um, so <clears throat> there we go. Okay, so we're, we're going with that. And the first thing we need to think about is what's our responsibility as Christians? How do we think about that? There's some pretty clear mandates. Uh, if we turn to Genesis, um, we will discover that, of course, there's what we call the creation mandate there, um, where God tells us that we need to be fruitful and fill the earth. And it says, and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens um, uh, and over every living thing. Now, dominion in that sense doesn't mean ruthless exploitation. Uh, it doesn't mean we do anything that we want to. We have to maintain a clear line between the creator and the created. But it does mean that we have pretty clear responsibilities. We can also turn to the Psalms. Um, we could look at Psalm 8. Uh, Psalm 8 talks about what happens if we happen to, if we look at the sky and we think about the stars and um, it asks the question, why is it that God is mindful of us? Uh, and yet it says uh, that he gave us charge over everything, uh, putting all things under our power. Um, by other places in scripture, we can turn to that. I would draw two basic implications from that. Um, move on to our next slide here. There we go. Um, first implication, of course, is we are to be in awe of God's creation. Uh, it's clear that it is to be respected. It is to be loved. Uh, many of you will put, your put yourselves in situations uh, in the outdoors where it's easy to be in awe and respect of it. Uh, the second thing that comes out of uh, the uh, implication is that we are the morally responsible creatures. Um, some environmental ethics, uh, ethicists draw that support uh, without a Christian mandate. I respect them for doing that. I think it's just very straightforward for us as Christians that we are to respect and love his creation. Uh, and number two, we are to steward it uh, and to try to take care of it. So let's turn to what I'm, what I'm talking about today, stewardship for everyone. Um, when I say stewardship for everyone, I'm gonna be talking about a system that thinks a lot about information. It uses decentralized information. Uh, it uses prices, and it also uses property rights because pr pr property rights are really the basis for prices. And then it relies upon entrepreneurial action to carry those sorts of things out. This system is somewhat different than how we oftentimes think about the economy uh, the, as an alternative to, so I see this system as basically an alternative to command and control, uh, or top-down mechanisms for dealing with environmental problems. The usual solution that we turn to when we come to environmental problems is say, well, this is just clearly something that government should take care of. Now, there is something behind that, and I'm gonna explain in what sense do I think that government has a very real responsibility for it, but it is, oftentimes isn't the command and control techniques uh, that we think of here. This instead, focuses on getting the incentives uh, and the information correct. And we'll move on here to the next, there we go, move on to the next slide. Um, so incentives and information are important um, and human dignity is important. Those two aspects really are at the, ba at the basis of what we're talking about here. And so one of the ways that we think about this is What's the information that the decision maker is getting? What's the incentives that the decision maker faces? 
because we think of those as the crucial sort of a thing uh, that uh, comes up here. Uh, this system is dynamic in a way uh, that regulations and legislation can't be. We live in a world of change. Uh, we understand a lot more about the interrelationships on, of different parts of the environment, of ecological relationships, all of those sorts of things uh, than we used to. We need to be able to respond to those. People's desires change uh, a lot. One of the things that happens when we get economic growth is uh, certain things become less important and other things actually become more important. Um, as you become wealthier, maybe another loaf of bread isn't quite as important as clean water, or maybe um, being able to have a few more hours of work uh, isn't as crucial to you as a good view. Uh, so all of those sorts of things we have to be able to respond to uh, in, in a way that allows us to take account of the information and incentives that people face. Let me turn to another issue, what we call the balance of nature, because behind much of what we think about is the idea that humans are really the problem. And I would argue that modern science is making a very different sort of an argument that there really is not a stable state of nature that we would return to if we only get humans out of the way, then everything's gonna be all okay because the world is in a state of stability except for human intervention. Two books that are important in terms of that, I could give you more, but one of them is Daniel Botkin, very well-known biologist, and his book, The Moon and the Harsh Mistress, or The Moon and the Nautilus Shell, and then Emma Morris, her book, uh, Rambunctious Garden. Both of those make the argument that the world is always in change. Uh, the different parts of it are interacting with one another, and that we as humans are a part of it. So we have to think about how we can best deal with those sorts of situations. Okay, let's move on to think about how we think about these sorts of problems. And I want to argue that all environmental problems are basically conflicting claims over property rights. If I drive by your car and I put a fluent into the air and that makes you unhappy, you're making a claim that I really don't have the right to put the affluent into your air. On the other hand, the fact that I'm doing it uh, and not feeling terribly guilty about it may well mean that I think that I have a property right to drive my car there. And so as we look at these sorts of issues, we almost always find that there's property rights that are being argued over or their property rights claims. This is important because this enables us to focus on how we can resolve those issues and how we can resolve them in ways that are cooperative. And that's why I'm gonna to turn to markets and property rights and prices uh, as a way of thinking about that because those are ways of cooperation. Okay, let's look at what I call the three Ds of effective property rights. Um, first one is property rights need to be defined. I have to say, do you own the air? Do I own the air? What portion of the air do you own? What portion of it do I own? Property rights also have to be defended. In other words, there has to be a way of making sure that the things that we've called upon as property rights um, can actually be adjudicated, that can be defended in a court of law. Now, that doesn't mean that it's always simple. There are what economists call transaction costs that are involved with defining and defending property rights. Uh, one of the things we need to do is to remember that there are real, art, uh, real transaction costs Sometimes there's artificial transaction costs. There's transaction costs that we've actually introduced to make it even more difficult uh, to define and defend them. The third one that I've put up here is divestible. Uh, that's just so my three Ds work. Uh, if you don't like divestible, call it transferable uh, because those are the three aspects of property rights. Property rights, we need to know what they are. We need to know how they're protected and then they need to be transferable. Interestingly enough, they don't all have to occur together. We'll be talking about some issues in a little while in which I will argue that the property right is pretty well defined. It's pretty well defended, but it's not divestible, not transferable. 
This means it can't move to its highest valued use. And that really stands in the way of human cooperation. So we'll come back to these as the, what I would call the aspects of property rights. Some people call them the bundle of sticks of property rights. Let's turn first to an area where we oftentimes have difficulties. It's called the tragedy of the commons. And this happens when we do not have well-defined property rights. Uh, what, what happens is people rush in to claim a resource uh, before others get there. Why? Because they don't have a clear right to the resource uh, and particularly to, to keeping the resource out of use. In other words, the, the way you get your property right is by using it. And an example that I have used in the past and Professor Estelle has heard me use uh, is the whole case of pizza. Um, suppose that 10 of you are all out uh, before pre-COVID and you order five large pizzas and you put them in the middle of the table and you start your consumption. It turns out that one of you uh, just is very much into taste and you're thinking a lot about the spices and you think about the quality of the crust and you're enjoying your pizza immensely. But it turns, out, it turns out as you look around, you're on piece number one and everybody else is on piece number three. In that sort of a situation, you may actually consume your pizza more rapidly than what you otherwise would. So we now we have a picture up here of a whole bunch of oil wells. That turns out to be Bakersfield, California, 1931. Why do we have all of those oil wells there? We have them because the underground pool, actually oil isn't in a pool, it's in uh, oil bearing sand or oil bearing rock, but the underground area of oil is a common property resource. How do you get the oil? You have to put up an oil well. So look at that vast array of oil wells in Bakersfield, California. And that has happened because a bunch of people have rushed in to try to get the oil out more rapidly than what they otherwise would. One of the interesting things is too rapid uh, uh, use of an uh, oil field actually decreases the total take out of it. But however you want to look at it, there just is overuse of it. People are using it much more rapidly than what they would uh, as a common property resource. Now we now have some legal rules, unification rules, that actually have been able to work pretty well with regard to oil wells. But let me turn to a couple of areas where we find that the oil well, that we do have ongoing property rights issues. The first is fisheries. Uh, many fisheries of the world have been open access or common property uh, resources where you own the fish if you caught it, but you didn't own it if you didn't catch it. So, so as you look at the fish and you say, well, I think a lot of these fish are gonna be more valuable next year, they're gonna grow, the market's gonna be more valuable, or they're gonna be more valuable in five years, it doesn't you do you any particular good to wait because somebody else will take it before you. And so that's one of the areas. Another area is the atmosphere. And this is more of a negative use of a common property resource. People may put way too much affluent waste into the atmosphere than what they would into their own property because it's owned by a lot of different people. You might want to go to the commons room in your dorm and ask uh, how well is it kept because it may well be a situation where nobody's really responsible for keeping it and it may look a lot worse than your dorm room. Now I've seen some dorm rooms and maybe that's not a good analogy. So, uh, so we'll, we'll, go, we'll go with that one anyway. So let's look at fisheries and uh, I want to propose a solution to fisheries. This is halibut fishing, fishing in Alaska. This is a halibut fishing boat. Um, the thing that really helps there is the 200 mile exclusive zone that exists around countries' physical boundaries. And that enables us, enables countries to use something called catch shares. Catch shares are a percentage of the total allowable catch. So it's a percentage, it's not a physical amount, the total amount that you should take from a fishery, and many fisheries are, are pretty well bounded, like the Alaska halibut fishery, we know pretty much where it is. Um, and so you have a percentage of the allowable catch. You need fish biologists that can tell you how many fish you can take in a year, and your percentage, the owner's percentage, so that's usually handed out on the basis of who were previously fishing, 
Um, and there are some controversies there about to whom do you give this property right, but it is a property right. It's saleable. It can be consolidated with other property rights. It can be divided up, all of those sorts of things. Prior to the cat shares that were used for the Alaska fishery, they were using input controls. And in the Alaska halibut fishery, they started out being able to fish 245 days out of the year. Um, and then they cut it down because people were overfishing. Well, if you're gonna only fish a more limited period of time, then what do you do? Well, you get a little bigger boat, you hire more people, you go out for longer periods of time. And the Alaska halibut fishery actually until through 1993, starting in the 1980s, in which people had the technology to catch a lot of fish, it went from six months to one month, to two weeks, then to two days. You could only fish in the Alaska halibut fishery for two days out of the year. So what do you think? And they would announce the day. So what do you think would happen in those days? It didn't matter the weather. You felt like you had to get out there. People took a lot of risks in terms of going out and fishing. Uh, they used the best equipment they could. They used the biggest crews that they could. Um, interestingly uh, enough, uh, halibut fishing is what we call long line fishing. So you let out a long cable that has hooks uh, on it and you bait it. And if you go, you only fish for two days and you're letting out say two or three lines and two of them could get tangled up and you don't have, you've got another 30 hours that you're going to fish. What do you do? Get out your axes and you start chopping. You chop those lines loose, they float in the ocean, they're still, they're still baited, fish will be caught on them, they will die, they will never make it to any sort of commercial use. In 1994, Alaska went with a catch share program. They've now been able to replenish the fishery. You can now fish for eight months out of the day, out of the year on the Alaska halibut fishery. And actually 45 different fisheries in the US have been rebuilt because of a catch share program. Other countries have done the same sort of a thing, New Zealand, Iceland, Chile, uh, Canada, um, Greenland, Holland. Those are all areas where a property rights regime has helped to mitigate or to ameliorate the problem of overfishing uh, with regard to the catch share issue. Now the 200 mile border does create some sorts of problems. For some countries, of course, there's some overlapping borders. And right now, Greece and Turkey are arguing about some fishing off of some Greek islands that are pretty close to the Turkey Turkish shore. So you do run into some issues there that are probably gonna have to be solved by treaty. Uh, but it doesn't mean that, we, that the property rights approach is useless. It's a very useful way of establishing quasi-property rights in a way such that we get fishing done by people. Uh, it's the most efficient use of material, but also then means that the, reef, the fish can uh, replenish and can maintain itself. Let's turn to another issue, water shortages. If we have shortages, uh, and this of course comes from an economist, um, if we have any long-term sorts of shortages, that means we don't have a functioning market. We don't spend a lot of policy problem worrying about shortages of cupcakes or white gym socks or things like that. Shortages basically imply the existence of um, or the lack of transferable property rights um, and, the and the functioning of the price mechanism. That's what takes care of our shortages. Uh, interestingly enough, in water, we have not done that. We're done with some very expensive sorts of methods rather than using prices and markets. In 1992, uh, the United States passed its uh, an Energy Efficiency Act and out of the Energy Efficiency Act, um, you can only have a low flow toilet. It used to be that toilets required three gallons to flush them. You can now nowhere legally in the United States can you buy a toilet that flushes by more than 1.6 gallons per flush. We've done a lot of other sorts of things, you know, and different uh, cities use uh, rationing sorts of mechanisms, particularly later in the summer. And some of you might be 
quite familiar with that, where you use a system uh, by using your house number. And if your house number is odd, then you get to uh, water on odd days of the week. If it's even, you get to water on even days of the week. It does mean that then it turns neighbors against neighbors because they think that there are, there are the, uh, watering at the wrong time. You'll find the police driving around at night with their windows open, listening and waiting for the swish, swish, swish of a sprinkler, uh, trying to think about who might be violating those sorts of, of rules. Let's ask the question uh, that will come up on the next slide. Um, why do we oppose prices? Um, and I think we oppose prices because we think of water as so essential for human existence. And we do need it uh, for existence, uh, drinking water. It's interesting though, if we look at the domestic water use in the United States, we're each using about 98 gallons per day. What does that mean? Well, it means there's lots of substitutes that are available. We need about a gallon per day uh, for survival and the World Health Organization uh, tells us, and it takes about 13 gallons per day for normal healthy living. The fact that we're consuming 98 gallons per day means lots of substitutes, lots of ways in which the price mechanism could work to allocate water uh, and not in a way that harms poor people. The last thing to remember on this slide is that water is a replenishable resource. There is a hydrological cycle. So it's unlike some other resources, we're not using it up. It's just coming in another form, but sometimes it's in the wrong form, wrong place, wrong time, uh, and we have to do something about it. Let's think about the price of water. What's the, what's the potential for trying to um, actually price it? Well, it is uh, in almost all of the US, we're paying less than a gallon, uh, excuse me, less than a penny a gallon for water. Could we double the price of water without doing great harm to people? Probably so. Um, part of the problem, of course, is that many users are not charged and it would require, uh, in some cities that don't have water meters, it would actually require that we uh, meter them to charge them for it. One of the interesting issues is, oh, what are we gonna run out of water? Well. Look at California. In California, agriculture uses 80% uh, of the water. What does that mean? Once again, it means that prices and markets would find substitutes. Let's turn to agriculture and just look at what's go what goes on there uh, in terms of water. And this is, this is one of the areas where we don't have transferability or what I call divestibility. Um, much of the water in agriculture actually comes from Bureau of Reclamation projects and their Bureau of Reclamation projects were designed for agriculture. So the farmer ordinarily cannot transfer them out of agriculture. Agriculture is generally getting water at about $20 an acre foot. Now a uh, acre foot is a lot of water. It's the amount of water to cover one acre of ground, one foot deep. And that's the price that most farmers are playing, paying. It depends upon the particular Bureau of Rec facility. In, for the person in agriculture, they're getting something out of that water. They're actually getting a subsidy. They're paying between 50 and $100 an acre foot. Uh, excuse me, they're getting about 50 to $100 an acre foot of good out of the water. So it's worth something to them. Interestingly enough, for almost all agricultural users, there are municipalities somewhere in the area that would be willing to pay between two and $3,000 an acre foot. And that actually is a pretty low number. Uh, some of the cities in California have bid $10,000 an acre foot. I've seen bids as high as twelve dollars to $14,000 an acre foot. Imagine that you're sitting at home and you've got a 2005 Honda Accord. It's kind of beat up, but it's worth $500 to you. But three blocks down the street, it's worth $2,000 to somebody else. What's gonna happen with the car? Well, it's probably not gonna stay in your possession. It's gonna to go to the person that values it a lot more. So one of the interesting sorts of things with regard to water is a lot of it is going to a pretty low valued use. Now it doesn't mean that agriculture is going to have to stop. If we look at, um, the, if we go, go to the California situation, 
we find that if we only took 4% uh, of the California water out of agriculture, it would increase the, for the other uses by 50%. So it really does mean that there's lots of room. Agriculture will still survive. Uh, the agricultural users will actually be happier because they've sold a resource that they value uh, to some people or more. The, um, so that's, I just think there's a lot of room for markets and prices to work uh, with respect to water. One last thing with regard to water, I've been talking about surface water that comes from, comes from runoff. There's also groundwater, the underground aquifers that we, uh, pump, that we uh, pump from. In a lot of the country, that's not a problem. There are some parts of the country where the groundwater is being depleted. The problem, once again, is that groundwater is a common property resource in most areas. So if you decide you'd like to leave it for a year from now or from five years from now, there's no assurance that it will be there because somebody else might put down their well and use it also. A big area where this has happened is in the Ogallala Aquifer in uh, the southern western United States and the Ogallala Aquifer has gone down. Um, some places the water table has dropped as much as 50 to 100, to 100 feet. There's actually some coastal areas that are now getting saltwater intrusion because of the problem of taking out too much water. Uh, again, there are some very straightforward property rights solutions to this issue. I'm very happy to talk about those in the question and answer period when we come to that. So we've mostly been talking about good things. We've been talking about water and we've been talking about fish. Let's turn to something that's maybe a little less pleasant, but something we like because it has some positive benefits. Let's look at atrazine. Atrazine is a broadleaf herbicide. It's used in corn, sugar, uh, uh, sugar cane. Uh, it's actually the most commonly detected herbicide in groundwater. So you can see why people might be concerned about it. And in fact, in the European Union, they actually banned the use of atrazine in 2004. So let me propose to you another solution, technologically possible, not in use presently in any place in the United States. I'll introduce you to a friend of mine. Here's Joe Farmer. Wave at Joe. Joe's waving at you. Uh, Joe's an is a uh, corn farmer in southern Wisconsin, and he uses atrazine. So Joe goes into the local uh, building and farm supply place, Spar Building and Farm Supply. He knows Bill Spar there pretty well, and he goes in and he says, Bill, I need my atrazine. I need five gallons of atrazine. That'll make me several thousand gallons of spray, and I'm going to put it on my corn. Well, Bill says, well, you know, Joe, I'll, here's the atrazine, and he sets it up on the counter, but he says, you know, Wisconsin has some new legislation. Now, every piece of atrazine that goes across my counter and that anybody in the whole state of Wisconsin has to be identified to the particular user. Now, there's a lot of ways of identifying it. You can put in a particular mix of an inert chemical. You can use a radioactive isotope. He says, I've got a whole bunch of different branded chemicals here, and I'm going to have to put in three ounces of this chemical into your atrazine. And you're going to be the only person that has this particular marker in your chemical. Well, Joe gets pretty bent out of shape. He says, this is a free country. What do you mean? I can't go out and put my atrazine on when I want to. Well, Bill's a pretty wise guy, and he says, you know, Joe, that favorite pickup of yours, that uh, 1984 uh, F-250, remember a couple of years ago, you were sitting at the coffee shop with your buddies, and somebody sideswiped you. But it turned out somebody else on the street saw the license plate of the person that was sideswiping you, and they reported him, and they were held accountable, and you actually got an insurance payment. Now, I know the insurance company didn't want to pay you a lot for the smashed in door on your pickup, but you still got something out of it. Now, on every vehicle, every moving vehicle on the public highways in Wisconsin, there's this little piece of metal. It's called a license plate. Now, I know you could say that that restricts your freedom, but in some other ways, it really expands your freedom because you can hold people responsible when they do things that might harm you. And that's what we're doing with the atrazine. We're putting a license plate on it. We're marking it. And if we do that, then all we need to do is to turn to common law. And under common law, 
there are the doctrines of trespass and nuisance. Under those, de un under those doctrines, uh, you have to be able to show harm. Um, you, have to, you have to be able to say, show that it's due to the actions of another identical pro uh, party. But if somebody finds atrazine in their water, they don't go to the state legislature and say, let's ban atrazine. They go to court and say, we're taking Joe to court because he put the bad stuff in the water. Well, this causes a couple of reactions. For one thing, Joe and some of his friends get to thinking about what could happen. They could be held personally responsible. So they go into the county agent and they say, you know, when we use atrazine, are there any things that we could do to make sure that this doesn't end up in groundwater or in runoff? And the county agent says, yeah, it's pretty straightforward. As long as you don't put the atrazine on um, in less than 12 hours before a rainstorm, or if you keep it more than eight feet away from the street, uh, stream bank, there's almost no danger of the atrazine entering into groundwater or into streams. Well, Joe's behavior changes. He looks about, he looks at the weather. He care, cares a lot about its application because there's a pretty clear property right that has been defined in terms of this particular herbicide. Okay, turn to something else, maybe a little more pleasant, uh, not always pleasant to people because uh, the world population is going down and that's the whole question of uh, wildlife. Let's look at elephants, elephants worldwide. Um, elephants on most of the world are the same way that most of the game in the United States is controlled. It's under state ownership. So the state is responsible for it. Well, we have some nice experiments in Africa. We could go to Kenya. If we go to Kenya, Kenya has used a system of state controlled management of the elephant population. And in an effort to try to avoid the depletion of the elephant population, they've had a ban on all hunting from the national level. Now, it turns out for the villagers, many of them see elephants as kind of like giant rats. They come in, they eat your population or eat your, your food, and you can't do anything about the population. So the villagers really don't have a lot of incentive to prevent poaching. Elephants, particularly elephant tusks, are valuable uh, for decoration, uh, for jewelry, all of those sorts of things. We have another very interesting case study, the country of Zimbabwe. In Zimbabwe, there is something called Campfire, a communal areas management program for indigenous resources. Now, I sometimes think about some bureaucrats sitting in an office spending a couple of days trying to get all of those letters to come out right so we could talk about Campfire. Uh, and they did come up with a pretty nice program there. Uh, so Campfire is the program. What it does is it gives quasi property rights to the elephants, to, uh, who, uh, to the elephants, to the people, property rights to the elephants, to the people who live in the local villages. They get control of them. They can actually sell photo safari rights. They can, they can also um, give the opportunity uh, for people to um, uh, take some of them as a trophy. I think we lost our slide here, but I'll just continue on and maybe we'll uh, get back to, the, uh, to this one. There we go. Um, so, and so these property rights turn out uh, to be important for the owner. They can, they can kill an elephant that comes in and eats their crops. Now let's look at what's happened to the elephants in Zimbabwe, in the place where, we, where they can actually shoot them. In Kenya, you couldn't shoot them, but the elephant population in Zimbabwe went from 37,000 in 1989 to 85,000 in 2006. I've stopped the numbers of 2006 simply because Zimbabwe has become kind of a basket case in terms of national uh, governance. And under Mugabe, the campfire program became at risk. It's still there. It still has some positive sorts of effects. But during the time when it really worked from um, 89 to 2006, uh, the elephant numbers went up from 37,000 to 85,000. Remember in Kenya, they went down and the campfire program generated $20 million in income for about 90,000 households. That's about a 20% increase in income 
uh, for each uh, household uh, in Zimbabwe. Why? They had a clear incentive uh, to try to do something about poaching and about maintaining uh, the population. And the Kenya population actually declined from 167,000 to uh, 50,000 today. Again, because not much, of, not much in the way of local interest uh, in terms of controlling it. Okay, last issue that I'll take up, one that I have a harder time with than others, simply because uh, we're gonna talk about global climate change. It is clearly a property rights problem because it's a, people, some people using their property in a way that harms other people's property. The difficulty is it's what we call a transboundary issue uh, and transboundary issues are more difficult to resolve, no matter how you look at it, from using property rights, using command and control, whatever your mechanism is, you're, you're, you're moving beyond sovereign governments uh, and trying to do something about it. So, but there are some ways in which we can think about it. I put them in three basic categories uh, in terms of solutions. The first is we could use uh, many more technological uh, innovations, technology inducement prizes. We could give $10, $10 million to the person that can come up in the next three years with the best carbon sequestration program or better batteries or something like that. So, and then continuing to fund and work on uh, research and development is something that could be helpful. We can adapt and we're going to adapt no matter what happens. Adapt means we just change our behavior because of what's going on and people do adapt. Some of the most significant or some of the larger estimates of the dangers of climate change actually come under the assumption that there is no human uh, adaptation. Well, that's just not true. It is happening. Whether that's sufficient or not is another sort uh, of an issue. One of the things we certainly can say is maybe we ought to quit doing things that make people more at risk from climate change. And one of them uh, is our subsidized flood insurance program. We continually pay people uh, more uh, than what they have to pay out of their own pocket for flood insurance uh, to live in areas that are flood prone. So simply getting away with that or just uh, charging a real risk based uh, premium would be useful. The final thing is mitigation and that's what we think about a lot and that is what can we do to actually reduce the carbon emissions. Uh, if we're thinking about that, if we're thinking about the pot potential solutions uh, that can come from mitigation. There's several that are, uh, that can happen there. Mitigation solutions, uh, one of them would be a revenue neutral carbon tax. I call it revenue neutral because generally when we're thinking about these sorts of things, we don't want to raise extra money for the government. We just want to solve the problem of the use of a resource. So that would mean we would put a tax on carbon and then we would remit to all of the people that are being taxed, usually on a per capita basis, the revenue that comes from the carbon tax. What that does is change relative prices. It makes the price of carbon uh, intense uh, machinery, carbon intense vacations, carbon intense other things, makes them more expensive. It means that people can move to doing less car uh, carbon intense sorts of activity. Another solution is cap and trade. Cap and trade means that a, that a particular area caps, and we could do this worldwide. I'll talk a little bit about that problem, but we could actually cap the amount of carbon emissions that we want to have occur within a particular period of time. Under cap and trade though, it does need, the actual cap needs to be tradable. So the person that can uh, get rid of the carbon the easiest, um, it, the day it'll be the cheapest way for that to happen. We did that with SO2 emissions in the US. It was pretty successful, uh, reduced SO2 emissions dramatically until um, the federal government uh, actually diluted the property rights dramatically there. There is a third solution, geoengineering. That one's on the horizon. People are thinking about that one. I don't know enough about it and we need enough more te technology there uh, that it, it's going to be, you know, I think it's a while before we know exactly how that would work. If we have a um, carbon tax, the good thing about a carbon tax or about a cap and trade thing is it will rely on prices. 
and it will rely on individual information. And people will be looking at those particular prices and making their adjustment in the best way that they think is possible. So it relies a lot more on local information. Both of these would remove the need for just a multitude of attempts to price carbon. And we do price carbon. Let me show you some of the ways that we presently price carbon. We have wind and solar tax credits. That's basically a price for trying to reduce carbon. We have an ethanol mandate. Uh, we have a corporate average fuel economy program. 29 states actually have renewable energy mandates. Now, one of the problems that I find when I look at people's solutions, whenever we start talking about the carbon tax, is they're almost always talking about, replace, about not replacing these programs. They just want to add the carbon tax to that particular, uh, to these particular programs. Uh, and again, if we go with the carbon tax, uh, we, would, uh, we would not need any of these programs and maybe some new sorts of things come online. I'm pretty optimistic about the use of nuclear energy, what we call third generation nuclear energy. Uh, Idaho just recently licensed nuclear, nuclear plants that are um, made in, in multiple, uh, multiple units. Uh, I think that it's a, uh, a carbon reducing technology that could come on. But again, all we need are prices to tell us whether it's nuclear, whether it's solar, whether it's gasoline, whether it's diesel, all of those sorts of things. What are some of the problems? We've got one of them up here already. If you get the carbon tax, it's going to generate a lot of money. And the idea, of course, is that this large pool of money, which ends up in the hand of the government, the legislators immediately turn around and remand it to all of the people. Well, we do have some experience with things like that when there are pools of money sitting in federal, at the federal government, uh, and it doesn't always go back to the people. So. One of the things we have to think about with regard to the carbon tax is, and it, if, if, we're, if we're doing it really to try to do something about relative prices, it should be remanded to the people. It should be done on a per capita income or per capita, per capita basis, not per capita income. If we go with the cap and trade program, um, we have to allocate the emission rights. Economists talk some about rent seeking. You can talk to Dr. Estelle about rent seeking if you want to, but there could be some pretty massive rent seeking going on about who gets the rights. Uh, if we look at the geoengineering, there's some unknowns there. Geoengineering is basically trying to re increase the reflectivity of the atmosphere or the ocean. I think there's some potential there. Um, not sure if we can, um, how soon we get there. There are other problems. We do need to set the tax or the cap uh, at the right level. Most of those things that I gave you about the efforts to try to actually price carbon, which we're doing with the uh, renewable standards that are required or the cafe standards or anything. So we're pricing carbon at about 100 to $600 a ton. Um, the nut estimates that I see is somewhere between $20 and $40 a ton. So we're using some very expensive methods. Uh, but we, we have, that would be one of the things we'd have to do uh, is uh, trying to see uh, what's the right way to do it. Um, I, would ask, I would add one more thing here that oftentimes does not end up as a part of the discussion. And that is, there's a lot of poor people in the world. Some of you were with me at a seminar on Saturday and we were discussing the fact that poverty has gone down. There still is a tremendous amount of poverty and the reduction of world poverty does depend heavily upon cheap energy. And it's a lot easier for those of us who live in a wealthy economy to think about what a 50% increase in fuel prices would mean. We can live with that. It would change our, it would, it would change our lifestyle some. You think about a 50% increase in fuel prices uh, to the poor people in the world, and that is a dramatic sort of an impact. Doesn't mean we shouldn't think about it, but that is just something that needs to be added to the discussion. Okay, one more. This is actually a graph. You're going to have an economics lecture with a graph. This is the one that causes me some discouragement. Look at the horizontal line. That is the CO2 emissions from the US. That's the, look at the blue line. 
That's the CO2 emissions from the rest of the world. What do we talk about? How do we argue? What's our politics about? Almost all of our politics are about doing something about that horizontal line. Well, we should perhaps do, be thinking about that. But the big question is, how do we deal worldwide with carbon emissions? What sort of a mechanism are we thinking about there? And there it becomes more problematic, lots of issues. Uh, if we're thinking about actually controlling it, maybe it takes a coercive mechanism. Uh, how do we feel about a worldwide coercive mechanism to control carbon emissions? And if we have one of those, how, how convinced are we that that coercive mechanism is just going to be used on CO2 emissions? So that's another problem that we just have to be willing to deal with uh, in terms of thinking about carbon. Okay, last slide. Stewardship for everyone. I've made an argument for a way of thinking about the environment that relies upon property rights and prices. Uh, it's different from the top down sort, sorts of ways. It does encourage social cooperation because that's the essence of property rights and prices. It tells people, look for the margin of agreement. How can you find somebody that has on the margin something that you agree with? And that's a very good sort of a thing. And the final thing is that it does allow for human initiative and human liberty in solving environmental problems. So I will stop there. And I'm not sure what the mechanism is here, but somehow between Professor Estelle and a student, uh, we're going to go to some questions and answers. Okay. Great. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Dr. Hill, for speaking. And that sure gives us a lot to consider. So we already have some thoughtful questions for you. But first, I wanted to offer two reminders to the audience. First, everyone is invited to submit questions using the button on the lower left of your screen. If you'd rather stay anonymous, please let us know. Otherwise, we'll share first names as we go, just so we can, again, reduce our social distance. Second, students, remember, if you'd like your professor to know you're here, send your name and your professor's email address, and that way we can, that way we can just know you're here and just use the same button. Okay. So the first question, Dr. Hill, comes from a HOPE student, Julia. She asks, do you think getting rid of or putting limits on all common property resources will hurt the economy in the long run? Would that interfere with specialized jobs? No. <laughs> getting rid of common property resources helps the economy because, now, now that's not true in, uh, there's some resources that are common property uh, and they're common property because we're not overusing them that dramatically. Or they're common property because it doesn't make sense to put in, uh, in expensive ways of monitoring and controlling it. But with the areas where we have common property issues, for instance, groundwater issues, uh, if we solve that problem, the economy will be better off because we're, we're going to be uh, using our resources at the appropriate sort of rate. So I see the big problem with uh, common property or what technically what economists call open access resources is we use them too rapidly. So if we solve those sorts of problems, we will use our, excuse me, we we'll use our resources at a more efficient, I'm sorry to introduce that word in an economics letter, in a lecture here, but it, at, a, at a better rate of use. And I actually think that the world is better off as we move to more, uh, to better defined and enforced property rights. Now that doesn't mean that, I mean, there are some areas we don't have uh, uh, property rights beyond common property. We have three children. Um, when we had three children in the home, our refrigerator was common property. But with some understood rules about what you could do with the property in it, because we all knew each other and we had a pretty good idea who might be sneaking in at night and taking things out of the refrigerator or some things like that. We didn't need uh, clear property rights in the refrigerator. Some of you in dorm, some of you in apartments that have actually shared refrigerators with your friends have actually had to go with property rights regimes. My property is shelf number one. 
your property is shelf number two and Amy's property is shelf number three. So that's just a case of sometimes you need those property rights, sometimes we don't. There's lots in the world in which they're open access property and they need to stay that way because we're not overusing them dramatically. Okay, let's move on. Thank you. So another HOPE student, Emily, asks the following. In regards to common law, how should we respond to the power of big corporations to avert common law, such as the company DuPont in Cincinnati that released toxic chemicals into water sources for decades unchecked? Well, we have to try to... Um, one of the interesting things is EPA permits. I, I actually hold the EPA responsible because uh, an EPA permit uh, means that the common law doesn't apply. And so sometimes when firms are permitted, then they use that as their legal defense. And if you can go back to common law, you can just show harm and you can show that a party that's doing it. Uh, it does mean that we have to think about uh, holding individuals responsible. But there's quite a few cases in which large firms would like to avoid the common law because they can get a permit in, and once you get the permit, then the common law, does, you, you can say the common law doesn't apply because I do have the legal permit to do it. So yes, the legal system has to be reformed at times. And there's times when power uh, has been used badly, even in common law sorts of jurisdictions. Um, Make, make it known, hold them accountable. Uh, the world is not a perfect place and sometimes people have gotten off with things they ought not to have gotten off with, uh, but uh, try to go back and say, uh, when harm has occurred, when we identify the person that has done that, you can actually get an injunction to stop it under common law, or you can get uh, a, a monetary payment uh, to compensate you for harm. And I actually think we would be better off going more in the direction of common law and away from some of the permitting that we actually do. Thank you. So another student, Anna asks, what are some environmental issues that are not widely known or cared about that you would consider important? Hmm, what ones do I care about that are not widely known? Um, I work at a research center and we try to think about everything that's important. So it's not, I'm not sure which are the ones that, um, that are not um, widely known. I do think in many parts of the country, uh, people are not aware of the groundwater problem uh, and that over time, uh, overuse of an underground aquifer is it's an issue. And so I would like to see um, more attention uh, to that sort of an issue. Um, on the other hand, I actually think that uh, the efforts to do completely away with risk um, you know, is uh, sometimes misguided. So I think being sensible about risk, we live in a, in, in a world of risk and our efforts to try to, to uh, Get, get away to a zero risk world, sometimes we just introduce uh, more sorts of risks. One of the interesting sorts of things that we've done is for instance in plants to try to move to plants that don't use uh, herbicides or pesticides, particularly not using pesticides in those plants. And so you do selective breeding and selective use. Well, those plants turn out to be higher in carcinogens than the original plants were. So it's not always the case that it makes sense to try to move completely away from uh, chemicals. I don't think a chemical free world is one that we necessarily uh, want to move to. I, again, I think that common law can be very helpful uh, in terms of holding people responsible to uh, do harm to other people. I'll think more about that one. And if I can think of some things that issues, uh, a lot of them are site specific. Uh, depend a lot on the particular situations. Uh, a lot of them are local sorts of issues. Uh, here in Montana, for instance, uh, wild game is an issue because elk spend about half their time on public lands and half of their time on cattle ranchers land in the wintertime. The state owns the elk, 
and the state uh, claims that they have uh, the right to sell access to the elk, but they're uh, to the elk, but they're pretty loath to pay to pay the ranchers for the use of their haystacks and their grazing. That's probably not an issue in Michigan. It is an issue here. So I'm not sure what the particular issues are uh, in Michigan. Um, once we get outside of, of massive air pollution issues or the global warming issue, many of the issues are local. They may be pollution related. Uh, they may be air related, but um, they're, they're pretty site specific. So I'll just have to plead that each of you is gonna have to find your own issues. <laughs> Thank you. So the next question is from Professor Victor Clark, who writes, the flood insurance program relative to climate change is very interesting. He then asks, Dr. Hill, could you please briefly explain how flood insurance currently works and why it may lead to less responsible behavior? Okay, uh, and we'll see. Uh, it could well be that Professor Clark knows more about this than I do, but we'll, we'll try to see if that works that way. No, you pay an insurance premium for your flood insurance. That premium doesn't cover the flood risk in many places. There's some, there's some homes that have been flooded a dozen times and they get their flood insurance and they come back and they build again there. Uh, so basically a flood insurance program that didn't subsidize people living in flood prone sorts of areas would be uh, what I would favor. And as you just look at the federal budget, there have been a, a couple of, of attempts to make the federal flood, flood pro program kind of pay for itself, to charge premiums that reflect the risk. And each time that, that has come up, some of the legislators from states where there's quite a bit of flooding say, well, my constituents would be pretty unhappy if they had to play, pay a premium that actually reflects the risk. And I actually think that people should pay the premium that reflects the risk. So it's just a, it's just a subsidy. Uh, the premiums are not uh, adjusted uh, over time to appropriately um, pay for the risk. And so uh, one of the problems of having a federal program of insurance is that it's just politically difficult uh, to charge premiums that are risk sensitive, that, that actually take account of the risk. Perfect. Our next question is from a member of Markets and Morality, where we've read about free market environmentalism or FME. Sam asks, why is FME not more popular nationwide? What is holding it back? Ah, good question. Um, maybe we're not persuasive enough. Maybe we haven't uh, connected the right dots. Uh, I would say uh, Dr. Estelle for her Markets and Morality group uh, handed out uh, the PERC report, and this is the 40th, 40th anniversary of PERC. I would say we have a lot better hearing than we did 40 years ago. Um, one of the first reviewers of a PERC publication said that free market environmentalism is an oxymoron, and the morons are the people that are making the arguments for it. I, I think one of the confusions is, is that when we talk about, say, free market environmentalism, or we talk about markets and property rights, we're talking about people can do anything they want to. No, this is trying to get the property rights in place. And that sometimes uses local initiative, doesn't use government, and many times it means that government needs to be involved in defining and enforcing property rights. So I would say we've made some progress in, in some of those sorts of areas. Um, I can't give you a better answer uh, in terms of why isn't it more popular? If more of you would like to come to PERC as a summer intern, we offer those to uh, graduate students. We have an undergraduate program that some of your people, some HOPE students have come to. Uh, and we'll just tell you more about it and try to be persuasive. I do think there is a general, uh, just a general conclusion on the part of people that when we find a problem in uh, our society, the answer is, uh, there, there's a government answer to that. What we just do, that that's the place that we turn to. And part of that goes with the idea that, well, government is different. You know, there's people in the private economy, but people, if we turn it to the public economy uh, or the 
the public sector, then people will be acting in the public interest. Well, I would argue that people in government are about the same as people in the private sector. Sometimes they're motivated by greed. Sometimes they're motivated by selfishness. Sometimes they're motivated by altruism. But the idea that government will be just the automatic solution um, is, is one of the issues. Another issue is that whenever we do something like that, we usually turn it over to the administrative state. So Congress will pass legislation. It will try to do something about the problem. Uh, but then there will be some agency that will try to do, try to deal with it. I think the information content at the national level when people are trying to deal with it isn't nearly as good as it is at the local level. And I think it's much harder to construct the incentives uh, at the bureaucratic level than it is at the private level. So we're still in it. We're still trying. I'm the old guy at PERC and there's a bunch of young people that are following me and uh, few years, hopefully you can pay attention to them uh, and they will try to tell you why uh, this approach of which I'm calling stewardship for everyone uh, is the way to go. So the next question is Sophia, a student from Duke University who has actually participated in one of those PERC programs oh, you mentioned. And she asks, is there an environmental area or resource that stands out to you as particularly difficult for assigning property rights, either in theory or in practice? Well, clearly air is always a problem. You know, now we're much closer to, we are able to put tracers uh, in, uh, into uh, the, the smokestacks of major polluters. So, I would say air is a traditional problem. It's any area that is difficult, that uh, what we would call migratory resources, which are basically air and water, are going to be our ongoing sort of problem. Land-based problems are not nearly as difficult because we can usually define and enforce property rights there. So air and water are more difficult. We now have the technology to do a much better job of uh, tracing the air, uh, the, the pollutants that come um, from, uh, from both air, from in air and water. There actually is an invention, uh, a guy by the name of Stedman, uh, who has an invention in which you can point uh, a laser at the tailpipe of a car and you can identify all of the pollutants that come from it. I would like to see that used. I'd like to see it at, you know, at freeway exits and freeway entrances. And then you send people a bill uh, you know, there's a pollution level uh, below which you don't have to pay anything. Uh, above that level, then you get charged. A large percentage of the pollution, um, uh, I'm not sure if these numbers are current, but it used to be the case that 50% of the pollution that comes from cars came from 5% of the cars. But there's 5% of the cars that are producing half of the pollution. If we could get rid of that 5%, then that would be a straightforward sort of a way to do it. So again, um, just keep thinking about property rights and keep thinking about modern technology as a technique for trying to do something about tracing uh, the pollutants because then that enables us to use property rights sorts of regimes. Well, Professor Dr. Stephen Boma Prediger submitted the following. Thoughtful advocates of every perspective, whether in economics or history or any academic discipline, are aware of the shortcomings and or weaknesses of their point of view. What are the shortcomings or weaknesses of your property rights approach in economics? The transaction costs of defining and enforcing property rights to everything. Um, transaction costs are high uh, for some areas. And in those areas, that's a very real shortcoming. And so then particularly as we look at global climate change and as we look at transboundary sorts of issues there, uh, the property rights approach um, has all sorts of problems uh, because we do not have a mechanism for both defining and defending the property rights at that area, in that arena. So I would say, high transaction cost areas is just a real shortcoming and saying that we need to define and defend the property rights doesn't necessarily solve that problem. And so once we get to transboundary problems, 
I would say that uh, those are going to be the ongoing issues that will be the weakest part of my approach, largely because property rights are defined and enforced by sovereign nations. And we're talking about things that uh, problems that exist between nations. So that becomes a very real difficulty. Another question, this one's from Thomas, who asks, scientists have indicated that we need to extract carbon that already exists in the atmosphere to help mitigate climate change. We have some pilot facilities to collect carbon from the air, but there is no use for the carbon once collected. Is this possible industry doomed because there is really no economic incentive? No, I don't know on that one. <laughs> You're getting beyond my, my technological expertise there. Um, I suppose in a, in a way, if, that's, if that is reducing carbon emissions dramatically, and if that's a successful way to do it, then this could be an area where you subsidize the purchase of the carbon. So it may require government intervention at various points uh, to try to carry out uh, some of the carbon reducing techniques. And I must confess on this one, I don't know enough about the market for carbon to tell you um, what's the best way to go about doing that. Uh, I do think if we talk about these transboundary sorts of problems, um, I, in a sense, I made a case for individual initiative, uh, for people on the ground doing things. But once we talk about transboundary programs, we're talking about government intervention. And it, we will be talking about government to government treaties uh, trying to deal with the issue. Uh, because I don't think there's gonna be any way to get around that by just individuals dealing with individuals uh, on that particular issue. Related to international issues and transboundary issues, another HOPE student, Merrill asks, although it is important for the rest of the world to reduce their emissions, do you think the US should as well? Well, there's an interesting question. Should the, US, should the U.S. be kind of a moral leader in terms of reducing our emissions? And there's two schools of thought with regard to that. One of those says, yes, we would provide significant moral leadership if we went ahead and reduced our emissions. Uh, second one says, no, we're just a sucker if we do that, and we're simply allowing the countries uh, that are, you know, China's putting up new coal plants fairly regularly, uh, to go ahead and uh, do it. Um, I think that we should be thinking about, for instance, I would, I think we ought to think seriously about a carbon tax at a fairly low level, uh, just trying that out, seeing how it works. One of the problems is that carbon taxes are politically very unpopular. So there is some question about how far can we go with them. Um, state of Washington tried them, voted them out. Australia tried them, and then uh, the government uh, lost in the last election because uh, of uh, trying to do something about carbon. So we may be a ways away in terms of that. I don't know if cap and trade is any more politically viable or not. I do think, I guess I would come down on the side of moral leadership, but I would do that not overnight. I would uh, perhaps use a carbon tax at a low level, uh, see how effective it is, see if it can't be uh, used as a substitute for other things that we do that are quite expensive, um, and then uh, have to see if we can go from there. Uh, William Nordhaus, um, Nobel winning economist, probably one of the foremost experts on climate change, has suggested that some of the rich nations of the world, particularly North America and Western Europe, go ahead and put in a carbon tax. Um, now he, if you look at his numbers, um, it's still not gonna make much difference in terms of worldwide emissions. Maybe, and I haven't read Nordhaus fully on this, maybe Nordhaus thinks that the uh, moral leadership is important there. And that could well be uh, that we, need to go ahead and do something about carbon emissions. Um, I do think the renewable standards uh, many times are just invoking really high costs. Uh, when we say that, a, that a, a particular state says that we have to have say renewable, completely renewable by the year 2035, that's just gonna be 
very, very costly. And I like carbon taxes because it puts it, the decision back down at the local level. It tries to get the prices right. Uh, and as I said earlier, I'm reasonably optimistic about what's called advanced nuclear technology uh, or third generation nuclear uh, efforts. Now I know for, it's always interesting to me that some of the same people that worry a lot about carbon emissions seem to be adamantly opposed to any use of nuclear. I figure we live in a risky world and if the risks are great from carbon emissions, I actually uh, assess the risks of being much lower from going with really modern nuclear power. Now that's quite different than some of the nuclear plants that we have used in the past that do have uh, meltdown sorts of dangers. I'm not sure if you'll have any thoughts on this, Dr. Hill, but we do have a brief question from another faculty member. Okay. Can you, can you comment on the possibility of a black market and unmarked atrazine emerging? Um, not so much in the US, in other areas. I mean, sure, you, you could put on uh, tracers. Um, that could be a problem. Uh, I think we've got reasonable enforcement uh, mechanisms. Uh, a black market could exist in anything that we put a pollution tax on or that we put a marker in. Um, the nice thing about the markers is that it moves people, that generally appeals to people, people's idea of freedom under a constraint of property rights. So I would predict that if you used markers in atrazine, that farmers fairly quickly would say, yeah, I think that makes sense. I need to be held re responsible for my actions uh, and other people need to be held responsible for their actions. Uh, I've been involved in cattle ranching most of my life and we're now going with a program where you can put uh, a, a readable ear tag uh, in cattle uh, and you can ind individually identify them. And then you can find out if you've used antibiotics uh, too late in the process uh, that then um, make the meat. Um, I mean, the, the whole question is, can you advertise your meat as antibiotic free? Ranchers that I've talked to uh, say, hey, look, there are some scallywags out there and they use antibiotics in the feed um, long after they're supposed to. And they're supposed to be dealt with. So the general idea of being held accountable for your actions fits in some sense with kind of the independent spirit of ranchers and farmers. And again, this is just my reaction from my being involved with them, but being held accountable um, was something that they thought was quite appropriate. They thought it was a good sort of a thing because they thought that some of the people were not being held accountable and that that was bad for the industry. So, so sure, there could be a black market developed. I don't worry about that as much in, a, in the US as I might in countries that have uh, not nearly as clear a system of property rights definition and enforcement. Great. Perhaps this is a good way to wrap things up this evening. One last question from Leah, a HOPE student. What is the best way to talk to other people that have the best intentions to protect the environment but would never know how to use and apply free market principles to its advantage. I think talking about the whole idea of personal responsibility, uh, that each of us is responsible for the environment and a system that then builds on personal responsibility because this stewardship for everyone proposal that I'm giving to you here I, is one that is based upon people having the opportunity to act, people having the initiative to act, the information to act, and then the will to act. So I would argue just from the basis of, uh, we are responsible. We are the morally responsible creatures of the universe. And a system that enables us to act upon that moral responsibility um, is a good system. I would make an argument on the basis of personal responsibilities, a good thing. And let me tell you about some ways where people who are harming the environment 
or overusing a resource or not taking enough positive sorts of actions um, can take positive sorts of actions. So. Dr. Hill, thank you so much for sharing from your wisdom and expertise this evening. It has been thought provoking and personally challenging. If anyone would like to follow up with us at Markets and Morality, please remember our email address, marketsandmorality at hope.edu. Many thanks to our audience and have a wonderful evening. And thank you for your time. Good night. <laughs>